Welcome to Around the 412. I am Tyler. With me, as always, is Smitty. Be sure to go to our Twitter and check out our pinned tweet. We've got our Christmas fundraiser still going, where it's going to run till probably the second or third week of December, as it normally does. You can go check out uh, GoFundMe.com and also type in Rocket Around the 412 to really read about the mission, see what we've got going on. It's all about raising money for families and trying to provide Christmas for some kids that didn't have the same opportunities that Smitty and I did growing up. So if you want to go to our pin tweet, you can check it out there and gofundme.com type in rock around the 412. You can check it all out there and you can donate if you so please. And also we are doing a giveaway for week two of the Steelers season. We're going to be giving away a chase clay pole Jersey. And for those listening, all you have to do is go subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're trying to grow that up and we are trying to do the best we can to give back to the people that are loyal to us and that want to help us out and subscribe to us. So to go check, check that out, give us a subscribe, show us that you're subscribed to us on YouTube and you could have your chance to win a chase clay pole Jersey. Um, obviously rock around the four one two is, I always talk about it being the most important thing to me. I think you guys are getting uh emotional Smitty, uh, the first episode back independently and in, like what we were just talking about in, like three or so years. Um, I four. just have like this. Yeah. I just, my heart is like racing right now. And I think the reason is there's something I wanted to bring up um, in, in a show that we did earlier this month, because this month is so important to me as well. It being suicide awareness month, entire month of September. As you guys know, like I've, I've battled my own stuff. I, I talk about it openly because of a couple reasons. One, there's a lot of people that are still here that feel like they can't do so, um, you know, because it's just, there's such a stigma surrounding the topic and they feel like they're, they're weak if they talk about such things to the people that aren't still here to talk about it, that actually did go through with it. Um, and it's, it's something that five years ago, uh, this past March was something that I thought about. And luckily I, when I closed my eyes and was standing on that bridge, I had an epiphany of sorts where I saw my family and my, my late grandmother who had given me the necklace I was wearing that night and took off and put on that bridge. And, you know, something told me to not do it. And that was literally the only reason I did. I was in such a low place. I didn't care about myself. I cared about everybody else besides myself. So I knew what I had to focus on. And I got back to a great point where I, I sit here today, not sad about these things. I, I'm in a really good place. I'm happy with the way that my life has gone since that day. I've cut out the toxicity in my life. I think this podcast was a big part of that. I think rocking around the 412 is a big part of it, but it's just something that I wanted to start off talking this episode uh, about because I really felt remiss when I was thinking back to last week's show, the first episode that we did in September, and we didn't touch on this at all. And I think it's something, no, it, it has nothing to do with sports, but I think everybody knows that life is so much bigger than sports. We're so much bigger than sports. We want to talk about sports, obviously being the biggest thing that we talk about, but we don't want to be confined to just that and be defined by just Pittsburgh sports. So I don't know if you want to add anything to this. You didn't know that I was going to talk about this at all. I had no idea. Um, I don't know how I'm going to top that. <laughs> uh, so I will just second everything Smitty is saying. And as far as you go, I mean, I mean, I, along with many others, are happy that you are here, uh, and we're. I, I'm happy that this is an outlet and so, that's something that could give you that happiness. And like, like you said, I mean, rock around the four one two. I mean, just just to good bring it all back to that. That's something mm -hmm. that brings both happiness. Um, it's one of the best thing. If not, it is the best thing that both of us do. And I, I don't think any of us can either top that. So. Uh, but yeah, as far as that goes, no idea that you were going to be saying that, but I appreciate yeah. all the words. I know many people will appreciate all those words. We all have our trials. I've had them as well. Um, but remember that all of it, anytime that you're going through something, there's always going to be somebody there that will be willing to listen. If, if any of you are ever going through anything, no, Smitty and I, our DMS are open. You can even around the four one twos are open. around the four, around the four one two followers. <laughs> yeah. Almost 16,000 followers on that thing. And we, we, we got a little bit of a jump by the way, went from 15.3 to 15. That Najee Jersey, that Najee Jersey th shout out to everybody that retweeted that tweet. Um, but yeah, if you ever need to reach out to either of us, both of us will be available any time of the day. We will feel free to listen and to hear what you have to say and know that you were heard. Yeah, especially because with me, I got a lot more free time now. I don't know if you guys heard, but <laughs> I'm basically open 24-7, so reach out to me. Uh, 
yeah, this this podcast has brought me a, a, a ton of happiness. What hasn't brought me a ton of happiness is the Pittsburgh Pirates. Let's start right there. Um, however, they I mean, did you want to talk a, about depression? That, that's, <laughs> a four this game is a good topic. Sweep. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, a four game sweep over the Reds, though, where they're now in a position where like they can go. They need to win eight of their final nineteen games to finish it's, with not a hundred losses. It's so sad that we're like they put themselves they... in a position to not lose a hundred <laughs> games. That is that Seriously, is the bright that's, spot that's of what at. we have right now. That, that is, is so pathetic. I mean that that's just so pathetic. It's sad to, that that the bright spot is okay. The Pirates, who are a terrible team, beat another really bad team and a few times, and now we might not lose 100 games. That's what we yep. get to talk about. Meanwhile, Dodgers, Yankees fans, they get to talk about the postseason pretty soon. I mean, we're, we're just kind of counting down the days until the season's over, and we'll yeah. see if they lose 100 games at that point. But the fact that, yeah, 8-11 and 11 is what they have to go, do, do we think they get there? So let, let's let's dive into this a little bit. Um, right. We can do that. But actually, the first thing I wanted to talk about with the Pirates was I know that you were out with Kennedy last night. You went to dinner, right? You guys had was it like an, an anniversary of sorts or something like I mean, not or... not exactly an anniversary. I mean, six months of marriage. Uh, we've been married for okay. six months right. at that point. Flown by, honestly. Yeah. Um, oh. Kind of wild. But seriously, I mean, I feel like it was it was yesterday. But um, anyway, so I, I don't know that you kept up with the pirate game at all Luis Ortiz came up which is a guy like prior to the season I didn't have on my radar like he started at high a he was their opening day starter down there he came up here and absolutely dominated people were drawing comparisons to Cueto and I don't know if that was just the hair because personally I, I didn't see a ton of that um he throws gas though like I think he throws harder than Cueto ever has does um, he do the little back shoulder turn that Cueto did I, is, no, is that didn't it? See it nope didn't see that at all. I mean, I don't know if there's something there that I'm missing, but you guys can let me know in the comments. I mean, I'm, I'm looking stuff. at the stat now. So it, yeah. it's, it's a good, I mean, it's a good line. Five and two thirds pitched, one hit, three walks, five strikeouts. I mean, that's that's better than pretty much most of the starters we had all season. Yeah. And I, I don't know that that really does him justice. I mean, this guy was attacking hitters from the jump, going after guys, getting, you know, soft contact when guys were making contact. Uh, he actually should have had one more strikeout um, because they, a guy tried to bunt for a hit and popped up the third strike. If what you catch it, it's not a strikeout. But if the catcher would have just dropped it, it was a strikeout. So he should have had six Ks. Um, if you but try to bunt really, for a hit, you're a loser. I'm sorry. How, how do you bunt with <laughs> two strikes, too? I mean, that's just... It's but bold. anyway, yeah. Uh, Luis Ortiz, very promising start. And, and maybe this is a guy all of a sudden on the radar to like watch going into next year. The thing is, for this season, uh, because he was the 29th man added to the roster, is he can't come back up for another 15 days unless there's an injury. So you're not looking at a guy like, oh, they okay, they can just start him again in five days. He's not going to be able to do that unless there is an injury to somebody and they can bring him back up that way. But very encouraging first start for sure in the majors. And this is all of a sudden the guy I'm looking at like, man, if this guy is legit, you got him, you got Rowanzi, you saw what Mitch Keller was able to do this year. Um, I, I mean, the thing for me is I don't think Oviedo is a starter. I think he's looked like promising, and I think that you got something there for the bullpen. I don't view him as a starter. JT Brubaker kind of is what he is. I think he's a serviceable, serviceable back-end guy. But I'm still looking at this team thinking, all right, they need you know two starters in the offseason. Whether they do that or not, I don't know. But that's still how I'm viewing this rotation. Yeah, I mean, I remember preseason we were talking about like future cast, I guess, what mm -hmm. the team could look like in in terms of prospects. Do we think that they'll have the arms within the system already to build a rotation and bullpen? And we thought that, I mean, of course, when you're getting into contention time, it's funny that we're talking about contention whenever they're on the brink of losing 100 games. Um, <laughs> you're going to have a couple guys brought in but like via trade or via free agency. I mean, that's just kind of how those teams go. But mm -hmm. I, I do feel like the Pirates have enough arms within their system to kind of get them get them there, and then they can acquire those arms over the top to get them over the top once they get into that contending spot. Now, I mean, they're they're all going to have to work out. I mean, that, that's for sure. That that there's not going to be much room for error at that point, and there never is for small market teams. But I think internally, you've got something going with some of the arms that you have in your system that could get you to the, the starting pitching that you would like to have when you are potentially a contender. And you can have some bullpen arms that you have in your, your system right now that could be 
serviceable when you are a contender. That doesn't mean you're going to get all of them from your their, your system. I mean, that's just impossible, pretty much. But mm-hmm. you are going. I think they have some that can get them to that place. Yeah, and that's about all you can say. I already talked about him a couple of weeks ago. I, I don't necessarily think we need to talk about him again. But Rodolfo Castro. There's not been many hitters across Major League Baseball that have been better in the month of September, let alone what he's provided for the Pirates. I mean, when you look at what him, O'Neill Cruz, Brian Reynolds are doing this month, keep Brian's bats come around a little bit, which is nice to see because I think this year we've kind of seen the floor of what he is as a player because he hasn't been very good offensively, still really good defensively. Um, but you know, if they can finish out this season strong. I'm not necessarily going into 2023 like super optimistic, but I think that all of a sudden there's like some pieces there. Like, for example, with Rodolfo Castro, I'm looking at him and he's like the guy to me that you pencil him in as your opening day second baseman and you go from there. Hey, I I mean, you can't get much worse. Let's let's be honest. You can't you can't get much worse than being on the brink of another hundred season law or under lost season. Mm-hmm. Um so if they if they get within the like the eighty five to ninety loss season, sure, that, I think I would take that as much of improved. Um, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's going to be about... a work in progress. I mean, it, it's not going to be one season and then like it's it's not going to be a quick turnaround like that. That's just impossible. I feel like, I, but I do think you can see strides along that way, especially when you're looking at individuals. Yeah. And and that's my been my biggest issue with like the Sherrington tenure up to this point is I haven't seen enough of that at the MLB level. But I think, you know, by the midway point of next year, we really better start to see something. Because if if that isn't the case, what are we doing? Why is Brian Reynolds here? You know, I, I, yeah. I that's what I'm gonna start to be those are the questions I'm gonna start asking if they're not showing pretty severe improvement by the halfway point. Yeah, I mean year. I mean if you're if you're pretty much in the same boat that you were this year um oh or at least goodness. like it looks look it's like it's going to be that case then mm-hmm. you might as well look to move on from a guy like Brian Reynolds because you might as well maximize the value while you have it because if, if that's the case you're not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Especially when you look at so my biggest thing is like not only are they not getting better they are regressing defensively for sure and when you look at the offense I, the Andy Haynes plan is basically go up there and look at at least three pitches before you swing the bat I, I mean it's it's ridiculous <laughs> these guys are they don't, they're not going up there to be aggressive they're going up there to work counts and that to me is not the right approach I think it's so stupid to sit on a pitch uh, I'll be maybe I'm I just don't know what I'm talking you, what about what do you mean like you just always green light 3-0 is that what you mean no, well, yes. First, it, <laughs> it is so stu- to me. It's so stupid. If you have a pitch straight down the middle, why the hell are you not swinging? Why would you be told not to swing? I don't care if you can get a walk. What if you can get a home run? Which one's better? Which one's going to score you a run? Well, because yeah, the walk, and- you're the walk. You're probably going to hit into a double play anyway. Yeah, Rodolfo Castro is a guy that's not listening no to that sense. anyway. So. But but literally, even like first pitch, first pitch, if it is straight down the middle. Swing the freaking bat. I do I don't care. That's my philosophy. You have a good pitch that you like, swing the bat. Don't not swing because your coach is telling you to. That's a stupid idea. So the Pirates final stretch. We mentioned they need to go uh eight and eleven in this final 19 games to avoid the hundred losses. They uh that will be four with the Mets starting uh when you guys are watching or listening to this Thursday. Um, and then they got a, a quick two gamer with the Yankees. Um, followed by four with the Cubs, three with the Reds, and then six uh, to finish it out with the Cardinals. Is that, that in a row? Sense. Yep. All right. So we're talking about the division leading Mets, uh, the division leading Yankees, the division leading Cardinals. So 12 of the games are against those teams, if I heard that correctly. And then you have. Cubs and Reds, and those are divisional games, and those are some bad teams, so they can go either way. So mm-hmm. you're looking at 12 of the games against the division leaders, and you're saying we can only lose 11 games? Yeah, if they lose 12, it will be 100 losses. Yeah, they're, they're getting 100 losses. <laughs> Dude, there, there's no shot. The Mets, I'm going to say Cardinals, they don't, so one of us can be right. Well, I'm going to be right, because they're going to get 100 <laughs> losses. There's no shot that they, if 12 of their last games are against those teams and they can only lose 11 games total, there's no yeah. shot. Yeah. 
yeah, it, it's not promising when you look at the the road ahead. That that what was it like a stretch where they lost eleven in a row, whatever? Like that was that was the nail in the coffin for me. Where I was like, all right, they're going to lose hundred. We talked about how I mean, hard it is to I'll lose hundred games. Losing eleven in a row feels like every other month for the Pirates. I, I, at least yeah. it's not realistic, but I know that feels like that. Yeah. All right, let's completely flip the switch here. Uh, and go to a completely different sport. I'm wearing Steelers shirt right now. Najee and TJ, both guys banged up in Sunday's game uh, against uh, the I have Cincinnati a picture Bengals. Of Najee back there, not Sidney Crosby. He's also back there, but he's la- not. T- or Najee and TJ laying down. So okay. Um, TJ a little bit more significant, obviously. i um, gonna miss six weeks, but that is actually very good news based off what we originally thought. I mean. I'm sitting there watching the game. I, I not necessarily a, the best lip reader in the world, but I think everybody that has eyes should see what he said. Uh, he thought he tore his pack and he did tear his pack, but he didn't tear the tendon. So he's not, he doesn't need surgery. He can just rehab it. And so he's be fine. back within a, a six week time frame. Yeah. He's going to play Sunday. No, but uh, he's going to Cody Rhodes frame. it and come out with the, this <laughs> that, giant bruise. I mean, I, I've I, never I, felt better about a tweet. But it was yeah, so niche. That that's gonna be what he's gonna look like. I think he should come out like that. Now, honestly, if you're an offensive line, if you're the Patriots, you oh. see that. How are you gonna not be intimidated by that? I mean, sure, you yeah. can't see the chest, but just running down the arms. I I remember the picture of Cody Rhodes. It's a giant mm-hmm. bruise. That's basically what yep. TJ would look like. Also, I feel like you should be pretty impressed. I even know who Cody Rhodes is. I I yeah. I mean, when you said that, I was like, <laughs> okay. Uh, but seriously, like, I, could you imagine, like, especially because no one knew what to expect when Cody Rhodes un- unveiled that, like no one right. knew what it was going to look like. And then he pulled that off <laughs> oh, and then he wrestled an entire match like that and put on an unbelievable match. But it was such a niche tweet that I put out. I was like, I don't even know if people are really going to get this, but that blew up one of my best tweets ever. Give myself a pat on the back for that one. Um, and then the Najee Harris injury, which looked way worse, but thank God he is Gumby. Literally, I thought that he could have blew out his knee on that i thought everything in his his knee ankle everything was torn or broken or like his hip like the two injury going back to alabama like i was like this dude might not play football again with the way that it looked at the bottom of that pile uh he's just built different seriously he's I, I, he's unbelievable i don't even know what else to say yeah, i'm lost for words about him not being like injured because it sounds like he's gonna play turn around and play on Sunday. And this is a guy that came in with an injury that Liz Frank injury that he was nursing through a lot of training camp in the preseason. But um, again, he's Gumby and it sounds like he's going to be able to go on Sunday. Now, my question to you and my question to the people, do you want him to go on Sunday? Because not overly effective. And I know that the offensive line is, is primarily to blame there, but with him dealing with this injury, this pre-existing injury throughout you know, training camp in the preseason. Would you rather them just kind of rest this? They have the short week as well after New England with Cleveland on Thursday night football. Would you rather them just give him a little bit of time off? Um, honestly, probably. I feel like this game is within winning reach without Najee in the game. And I know that sounds like a big stretch, but I just don't think that the Steelers are going to be able to run the ball successfully that well either way, whether he's in the game or not. And I think that as far as Jalen Warren goes, I would assume that's going to be your RB1 if Najee isn't playing. Mm -hmm. I I think I saw enough from him, and not just when he was running the ball. I thought he did well in pass pro as well. I I, I think he impressed, and I think that he would be able to handle himself pretty well. I I would want to rest Najee. I wouldn't want to push it, uh, especially, I mean, the Patriots aren't the Patriots of old. I'm not really worried about that. So that's why I think the game is still capable of winning but i mean i'm looking at the the rushing totals from this past week's game they, they didn't really rush the ball a lot i they, Najee only carried the ball 10 times on the ground I, mm-hmm. I i feel like you're you would have a similar number maybe a little more with Jalen Warren if he was going to be the rb1 and maybe they'd mix in benny snell a little bit in that case but i just don't think that's worth trying to risk further injury of Najee. i mean we kind of like caught a break on this one that he wasn't injured if it's even like questionable, I would sit him out and just see what you got with Jalen Warren and then rely on the passing game in that in, on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, for me, I keep going back and forth on this. I'm just like, uh, it's not something that you do with a guy like Najee, but because Donnie, uh, Donnie Football, 93.7 The Fan, said yep. he put out a tweet like, would you sit Najee or would you play him if he's able to go? Like, would you be cautious with it or how would you treat this? 
I, I'm at the point where I think if he can go, I, I have him active, but I don't have him like his normal workload. Like Jalen Warren is mixing in way more than he normally would if you had a healthy Najee Harris. Well, I'll be honest, his and normal workload didn't show up last week either. That's, with 10 carries. I know. Yeah. And it's, but like, it would almost be situational. Like he's like your goal yeah. line back or like third down guy. Like I would have him active, but use him a lot less than what we would expect to see from a Najee Harris workload. Not, not the week one Najee Harris workload, what we expect the Steelers to look like um, by the time that the season, you know, comes to an end. And we're talking about what we expect to be a relatively balanced offense, uh, a lot more run heavy than we saw. Well, in week I one. hope it's more balanced because, Najee, yeah. I mean, he only had 10 carries, but he, he only had 23 yards on those 10 carries, 2.3 average. Yeah. That's it wasn't not great. in the passing game, really, either. I mean, it was, it was the no, Deontay he, he Johnson what, two and Matt catches? Friars. Yeah. So he, I mean, he didn't really touch the ball a lot. Uh, Mitch attempted 38 passes, which to me, that in itself is a surprise, especially because, like, the Steelers at no point trailed in this game. Like, I, I, like the game script was pretty favorable. But again, if you can't run the ball, that doesn't matter. Um, but 38 passing attempts, a little bit surprising. 12 targets for Deontay Johnson, 10 for Pat Fryermuth. So then you figure out behind that. Like, I think Chase Claypool had like six. So Pickens not involved. Najee Harris not involved. These other guys that like were complimentary pieces not involved. And if you would have told me that Mitch Trubisky is going to throw the ball 38 times, I would have thought, man, we're really spreading the ball around. No, wasn't the case. Deontay Johnson, Pat Fryermuth, it was their show. Yeah, screw everybody that said that Deontay Johnson was going to be fantasy worthy again. And he didn't even have a touchdown. He only had 55 yards, but he still got me 12 and a half points, which was a lot better than some of the other scrubs out there could say. I I, I still think De Deontay, even with the addition of George Pickens and all that stuff, and P Pat Fryermuth hopefully taking steps, Claypool wanting to be the wide receiver we thought we were getting out of Notre Dame, Deontay is still your clear cut number one. I mean, look at the catch he made on Sunday. Even Ben talked about it on his podcast that he texted him after the game saying, and De Deontay was just like, I felt like I needed to make a play. And it is like, yeah, you went out and made a play for sure. It's one of the best catches I had seen in a while. <laughs> I, yeah. I I feel like it's, it's going to be a heavy workload for Deontay still in the passing game. And I, I think that part of the reason that's the case still is, sure, they, they might be able to double cover Deontay, but at that point, then you're you're leaving single coverage on Claypool and Pickens. Uh, what a linebacker covering fire move? That's a joke. I, I think teams can't just naturally cover Deontay because he's got more weapons elsewhere. Yeah, fourth most targets uh, tied for fourth most targets in the NFL in Week One, which I wouldn't have thought that coming out like it, it didn't necessarily seem that way but especially down the stretch it was literally just Deontay or Pat that was being targeted in the passing game um but let's dive in more to this game I, I thought that like I even tweeted out offensively like up until that point where Najee scored that touchdown I thought I was seeing some creativity some different stuff being thrown at Cincinnati I thought Mitch was actually like handling the offense well they score that touchdown that all completely changed the offense went very vanilla they didn't target the middle of the field at all uh, up until I think the Friar Muth catch that kind of sealed the deal before the Boswell game winning field goal. That was the only time the ball was thrown yeah. to the middle of the field. Um, I, I it it looked a lot like, you know, the last couple of years we've seen from the offense. And again, like I know that there hasn't been like drastic improvement from the offensive line or anything like that. And that's probably the biggest thing to point your finger at. But man, how, how does it change in the course of a game the way that it did? Was Cincinnati adjusting, or, or where, where do you think this is? 16 I mean, first downs in total for the Steelers, by the way, in a game that went all the way through overtime. Yeah, I'm sure that there was some adjustments made by the Bengals. I mean, this is the NFL we're talking about. The coaches are smart. They know what's going on. So I'm sure there was, but maybe the Steelers also got into a case of we're going to play not to lose, and we're going to try to not turn over the ball. We're not going to get too aggressive. We have a lead. And the defense is playing really well, so maybe we we can just try to like milk this clock, mil milk out the game, and get away with the W and try to steal one. I think they took their their foot off the gas too early, and that's why I think the play calling changed. I think that like like you said, it was offensively at least it was kind of like a tale of two halves. The first half, for the most part, you were having some more creativity with the offense. I feel like, and then starting into that second or like towards the end of that second quarter, and then really all the way until the end of the game, it was super vanilla, like you were saying, and super boring offense. And to me, that is just saying, like, we're just playing not to lose. We're going to play it safe. We have a lead. We're going to we're gonna stick with what we're doing right now and not turn over the ball. We're not going to get too greedy or anything. And maybe that's because they have the inexperienced offensive line. Maybe that's because they have the 
uh, new quarterbacks in the room. I, I have no idea, but that's to me what I think whenever I was watching the game is that they, it was just like looked like they were just trying not to hurt themselves offensively to lose the game. Yeah, it's it, even offensively, like in the first half, it wasn't necessarily like all that great, but it was like I keep going back to those called different. Because, yeah, I just think like it was an execution issue in the first half where it's like they weren't even trying things in the second half. Um, but here's the thing is you're talking about playing to not lose. They would have lost that game if, if Minka Fitzpatrick doesn't block an extra point. So, you know, that that well, all being that, said. Yeah, that's that's why, though. I, I think that's why it's like they, they saw the defense and the defense was playing so good. So lights out five yeah. turnovers on the day. Is Seven that sacks? Yep. It, it, like they were playing ridiculous. So I can understand, or I don't understand it. I can reason with maybe they were just getting settled and like we are just going to rely on the defense to win this game. Ultimately, they did with like with with everything that they did. They were able to keep the the Steelers in the game and force it to go to overtime. And then luckily, Chris Boswell redeemed himself. And uh, honestly, for anybody that watched that BYU Baylor games, I was having a flash. <laughs> I was I was literally having a repeat yeah. in my head the night one before, day apart. Night before, literally, I was watching the same exact game. It's 20 to 20. They're in overtime. Both kickers miss field goals. It gets rushed to second overtime. That's when BYU ends up winning the game. They don't have a second overtime in the NFL. But both McPherson and Boswell miss the field goals. And I'm like, what am I watching? I'm literally watching a repeat of last night at the NFL level. Luckily, Boswell won the game with his foot. But, yeah, I think there's, it's – the offense was relying on the defense to win the game for them, and I think it showed in the play calling. They were just not even just playing not to lose. They were just playing not to turn over the ball. Yeah, I, I think that's been the emphasis for the offense is don't kill us. Like, give us a shot. Do not turn the football over. We need to win the turnover battle every single game. They win it by five in this game, and it still goes the duration of overtime. I want to flip that, though, to talk about the defense now because that is where we can have some really positive conversations. I understand they're going to have T.J. Watt for about six weeks. We will see. They haven't officially put him on IR. They have until Saturday to do so. I, I don't see a way that he doesn't miss four-plus at least. I think best-case scenario is that fifth or sixth week he comes back a week or two before the bye. I start to question, though, like if it would just be the week before the bye, would they be better off just you know having him sit that extra week through the bye and coming back week 10? But you know, we'll see how they decide to handle that. Obviously, when he was in there, I mean, I felt like I was watching one of the best defensive performances from this team in a long time, top to bottom, at all three levels. I mean, you, they were getting yeah. the pressure. The linebackers were playing well. I think credit to Devin Bush. I thought he did a strong I game. Mean, it, I, think I thought it was night and day that. from the preseason. Yeah, I think we need to say that by person because of everything that he's heard throughout the offseason. Um but you you look at everybody I, like Larry Ogunjobi was a guy that I said was the X factor for this team. I think through one game, I'm feeling really, really good about that prediction. This is a team that was 32nd against the run last year. They averaged, or I'm sorry, Joe Mixon averaged less than two yards per carry other than that 31 yard run that he broke off. If you take that away, his other 26 carries did not go for 52 yards. So you're talking about less than a two yards per carry average. Unbelievable performance from this defense, especially against the run. Obviously, Minka Fitzpatrick picked six. The secondary played well. Cam Sutton had a pick and averaged, uh, a, or I'm sorry, had a 5% pass or five pass rating when being targeted. Akello had a pick. Like literally everybody on this team contributed. Also, everybody that said Minka wasn't worth the money, <laughs> here you go. Hold that L real quick. Yeah, you got to be everybody watching, watching YouTube on more. YouTube. Hold yeah. that real quick for me. Dude, it was a great performance. And a couple other names that I don't think you mentioned Miles Jack. Good performance in the opening week for the Steelers. Alex Highsmith had a great, great week as well. His best as a Steeler. I mean, yeah. it's a short it, it, tenure so far, but. And I mean, what a game to do it too, because I mean, I, I said the Steelers were going to lose this game and I have mm -hmm. no shame in saying that. I, I literally thought they were going to, it would take a perfect performance from the, from the defense specifically for the team to pull this out. And that's really realistically what we got. It was an amazing game. It's a shame that TJ got hurt, but I mean, Thank goodness they made the Malik Reed trade uh, because yep. at least we have some security back there. If they didn't do that and we're looking at someone else besides Malik Reed coming in to fill in that gap, I don't know how I feel about that yeah. side of the defense uh, that so far, but at least I feel a little more comfortable knowing that that trade went through. 
Yeah, I, I think he paid some immediate div- dividends when you look at how the team played after TJ went out, obviously. But when I talk about the way that they played at all three levels, what you saw from Alex Highsmith, you know Cam Hayward just keeps getting better with age. This is why I feel like they're going to be able to stay above water even without TJ. I think you look at the, the schedule that they have leading up to that. Now, it does get rough uh, you know, in, in four weeks or so when they got Buffalo and Tampa Bay back-to-back. But you look at the next couple weeks here with New England, with Cleveland, uh, with the Jets, you know, they can stay above water here. And if, and if they go like three and three without TJ or something like that, even four and two, they're going to be in a really good spot when he returns to still be able to to be in, in competition for stuff and, and contend for spots in the playoff um, when he comes back. So I, I really like, obviously, the Malik Reed trade, like you mentioned, was absolutely huge, paid immediate dividends. Very necessary for for what we're about to go through without TJ Watt here, um, but I just think with this performance, with the way Alex Highsmith showed out, I, you and I thought that's what you were going to say was I think it was so important for Alex to have the game that he did in the same game that TJ gets hurt because it showed that like he can be that guy. Yeah, I mean for sure we I feel like a lot of Steeler Nation has wanted to see a step in Alex Highsmith's game. And I think yeah. we saw that on Sunday. We, we saw that he he can be an anchor on that defense just like TJ can. I mean, not to the same extent, obviously, but he's he can hold his own on the opposite side of the of the football. And I I feel like moving forward, I feel comfortable with him and Malik Reed um, and, and Alex being that main pass rusher. I, I, the, the whole defense is just so impressive. So impressive. And even if the offense is a similar to – a 2019 with with Duck Hodges and Mason Rudolph and all the problems that we had then. Oh, I mean, boy. with the way the defense played, and I'm not saying that they're going to be that bad. I don't think the mm. offense is going to be that bad. But even with the offense potentially being that bad, if the defense plays like this week week in and week out, you're going to win some games just based off of your defense, for sure. And I think that it's a, such a shame that TJ got hurt because in this game, he was showing why he is the best player in football. He's the best, especially on the defensive side of the ball. You want to argue quarterbacks and all that sort of stuff, sure. But defensively, I, I, I am fine saying he is better than Aaron Donald. A lot of people might hate me for that, but as of right now, he is the best player on the defensive side of the football in the game, period. The sacks, the pressure. The, he had an interception on Sunday. He was downright amazing and he's just gotten better every every year as he's been in the league. And it's a shame that he got hurt because imagine what his totals could have looked like this year at the level we saw on Sunday if he kept that up. Mm-hmm. I, I'm excited for him to come back, but I also have relief in knowing that I think the defense is going to be really good despite TJ Watt's absence. I l- I love that that move like the fake rush drop in the co- like drop a little bit. He did the yeah. same thing to Daniel Jones in the opener in 2020 that he th- did the burrow. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you talked about what he does in the run game too. I mean, he blew up that one play. He almost took the handoff from burrow right before tackling <laughs> Mixon. I mean, unbelievable. Um, obviously speedy recovery, wanted to come back hundred percent would be awesome. If it lines up for him to come back for a home game, because it would be absolutely ridiculous when he came out of the tunnel, but whenever he can get back close to hundred percent as possible, I, I really think that this defense is going to be able to hold its own without him and and stay afloat. Um, but continuing on, um, I looked at man. I think the rest of the secondary kind of want to notice because of the game that Minka had. Like I, I, I said, like I feel like Alex Highsmith had the best game in his short career. I also feel like Minka Fitzpatrick had his best game as a Steeler. And you know, I think that you you looked at the 2019 season, like when he first came over. You know, obviously, first game he played was part of three turnovers against San Fran. But this game, I think he just had everything. You know, he had the turnover, the pick six. He had the block extra point, the way that he was getting in guys' faces. Like, he played an AFC North football game. And for a guy that He got double middle was, fingers from Jamar Chase. Yeah. He for pissed a guy him that, off enough to do that. <laughs> exactly. For a guy that when he came over in his first, you know, bit of time here, people were saying it's too soft to play in the AFC North. He, he shies away from contact. He doesn't want to tackle guys. I mean, this was the game. Like, this was a stamp for me. This is the stamp of saying this guy was worth the trade. This guy was worth the money that he just got paid at the time to make him the highest paid safety. That's obviously since been eclipsed by Derwin James, but he was well worth it. And this is a guy, again, why I feel like obviously way different positions, but because of the communication they have on the back end and him kind of being the quarterback for this defense, 
is going to allow this team to hold its its weight and stay above water in the absence of TJ Watt. Yeah, and I I think something that doesn't get enough credit, and I think people that really know football they they, they know that this is the case, but. For a lot of casuals, they don't realize that a lot of pressure and a lot of sacks that happen happen because of the secondary, and it's because of the coverage that is the case. It's it's like a coverage sack is what they call it, and mm -hmm. it, it, it's because the secondary was playing so well. Burrow didn't know what to do with the football, and he had to hold on to it, and that's why he gets pressured sometimes. And obviously, I'm not trying to take it in anything away from that front seven. They did their thing as well, but sometimes – it helps to have a really good secondary to get you into those situations as well. And I think that Sunday, some of those pressures were the case. I, I think the coverage was being really, really well. I mean, like you said, I think I think that Cam Sutton had a really good game. I think that Levi Wallace had a really good game. Like literally the entire secondary played Arthur Millette. very well. Arthur Millette. Yeah, I, 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 I think that some guys that – not that we weren't unsure about some of them, but like Akella Witherspoon, we had confidence in. But was it going to be another James Pierre situation where it's like, okay, the sample size is small. What's he going to be like as a long-term starter? I, I get it as one game, but, I mean, in this first game, looked pretty good. Levi Wallace, new from Buffalo. What, what's he going to look like in a steel uniform in a regular season game? He looked really good. I, I, I'm excited about the secondary, and I, I, I think that it gives me some relief as well because I had some pause about it because we were looking like, what, what's it going to look like outside of Minka? I mean, we know Minka's a dog. But I, I, I think we have some really good players in the secondary as well. And they helped on Sunday get some of those pressures on Joe Burial too. I think what was so interesting to me was, and I don't know how many people like are going to pick up on this right away or have to go back and watch it, um, was how different the defensive looks were. Like I think it was very clear uh, Brian Flores's um, Influence. Contribution. I influence. That's the right word. <laughs> to this defense, because I think it was kind of a mix uh, of Terrell Austin and Brian Flores. When you talk about like the split safety stuff that Terrell Austin likes to do and the man coverage tendencies that Flores likes to do, uh, they went and cover two on 23 snaps and cover one on 17 snaps. Cincinnati, or 50 percent of Cincinnati's passing plays. Like I think when you in, in some of the blitz stuff they threw at them, it's very clear that Tomlin, Terrell Austin, and Brian Flores are all three going to have a mix in what this defense does. And one for one so far, I mean, they, they held the AFC, defending AFC champions, to 20 points in a game that went to overtime, and their defense is the only reason they won this football game. And, and that's why I think this game is so impressive for the defense as well. If they have this performance against, like, the Jets or the Jaguars, it's still impressive, but... We're talking about the defending AFC champions, and we're mm -hmm. also talking about a offense that has a lot of weapons and was being hyped up all off season again. And then even Joe Burrow saying like was complimenting like Mixon. And then if you want to cover man, good luck. Yeah, well, good luck winning against the Steelers next time because you lost this week. <laughs> I, I I think that they they did a really good job against a really good team. I I don't think that the Bengals. I do think they were a little overrated as far as like, they, I don't think they were the best AFC team, even though they made it to the Super Bowl, but they're still a solid team. Yeah. So it, it was were, a great performance. Listen, I, and they probably got better along that offensive line. That's going to take time to gel though. Like that's why if you were going to play them, week one was definitely the time to do it. Similarly to Buffalo last year where we said the same thing. Like if you're going to play this team, you want them early in the season before they can really get going. Um, so uh, obviously great to go on the road and get that win because next time we match up with Cincinnati, it's going to be at our place, Sunday Night Football. Um, but does this win change the outlook of the season at all for you? I mean, obviously you got to take into consideration the TJ injury as well. You know, if Najee Harris isn't going to be 100%, all these things come into, into play, but we're only through one game here. Has your opinion of this team changed? I think it has a little bit um, just because well, we're, we're still – kind of waiting and seeing what we are totally offensively. We'll see if the offensive line can figure it out a little bit more. And the, those are just things that happen throughout the season and as, it, as it gels together. But, I mean, defensively, they were super impressive. I didn't know what we were going to get as far as linebacker play, some of the secondary play. If, if they keep it up like that, I, I, I have no worries throughout the season, at least as far as the defense goes, even despite the TJ injury. I mean, that's a huge loss. But like I said, we have Malik Reed in there. I, I'm confident of what he can do in relief of TJ. I, I think it changes as far as like my win total goes because 
I, I predicted last season like eight and nine. I I could flip that to like nine and eight. And I, part of the reason last is I, I had them losing this game. So I was counting that towards my win total. I think I feel like the yeah. fact that they won this game, I, I, I kind of have to imagine like, okay, now I could see a, a world where they're getting to at least nine wins. So, yeah, I, I think the team outlook has changed in a more positive light for me after week one. Yeah, the thing for me is like, and I've said this, I'm not like a week by week, game by game prediction guy. I know like one year, a couple of years ago, we decided to do that. We did like a live stream, went through and said if it was going to be a win or loss or right. whatever. But on my own, I really don't do that. It's just because they're going to lose games that you think they should win. They're going to win games that you think they should lose. And that's kind of how I'm looking at this week one. Yeah, like if I were picking it, I would have said they're going to lose this football game. They won it. So in theory, you would think that that would change my prediction for the season to 10 and 7. I'm not going to. I still think they, they're going to go 9 and 8. Yeah. I still think that it's going to balance out to, to the way that I said. I think that this is a 9 and 8 football team. But what I will say is I went into that and said that prediction like you had questions i had questions about okay i like the addition of larry ogunjobi you're getting tyson alu back you added miles jack does that alone you added the marvin leal as, as well as a, a piece in the draft does that alone those things revamping that automatically mean that you're going to improve drastically against the run they're one for one in doing that so mm -hmm. if that were to continue Obviously, like my, my opinion can definitely be changed on what this team's going to be. I want to see the offense take a, a step in week two before I before I say anything about my outlook of the team changing. But I think when you look at the road ahead, New England, Cleveland on a short week, but Cleveland would also be on a short week. And then the Jets, it, it's not out of the realm of possibility. They're about to start off four and oh. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but just going game by game it that way, it, it, that is the case. And I I am also just want to put that out there. I'm not the one that like normally goes game by game and tries to predict win and losses. I just remember last week I did it because mm -hmm. in our, our notes for the show, we were going to give a prediction for the season. And I'm like, okay, I just have to do this to like kind of space it out. And in my head, what am I thinking as far as the team goes based off of their schedule as well? Yeah. But I mean, part of the reason, and not just because I had this as a loss, but like we're saying, it, they really impressed me. They've really showed me that they can play ball, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Like Devin Bush, shout out to you. Miles Jack, Larry Ogunjobi, the new guys, shout out to all you guys. I was very impressed as a whole. I want to see more from the offense, but the team impressed me in week one. I mean, we've been saying it. If this is a lead average offense, then I'm looking at a team that's going to win 10 or 11 games. Yeah. But if this is the offense that we saw in week one, that defense can't do that every single week. It's just not, it's not possible. They're not going to turn the ball over five times. They're not going to have seven sacks, especially in the stint that they're about to have without TJ Watt. So I think you have to temper expectations for the team based off if that offense can get more to a lead average unit. Um, the talent is certainly there within the skill players. Matt Canada and offensive line. It's on you guys. Hey, we'll see. I mean, they play the Patriots this Sunday. Maybe we'll get some more creativity and the, they'll actually try to push the ball down the field more and actually not look like they're just trying not to turn the ball over and trying not to lose the game and trying not to kill us, as you said. Yep. And Mike yep. Tomlin said, that's a Mike Tomlin quote, right? Uh, going back to they're 2019. Not, they're not killing. They didn't, they didn't kill us or something like that. Yeah. yeah, going back to 2019 when when he was sticking with Hodges over Mason, he said he hasn't oh, yeah. killed us yet. He hasn't killed yeah. us yet. Why did I just call Duck by his last name, Hodges? Like, no one did that. It was Hodges. All duck. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I think that's about it, guys and girls. Um, I don't have anything else unless you do. By the next time that we're talking, we're going to be talking about uh, this New England game and hopefully seeing a lot more from the offensive side of the football. Nope. I mean, last thing for me, just another reminder, we're going to be giving away a Chase Claypool jersey this week. Go subscribe to our YouTube. Just search around the 412. Should pop up. We're trying to up the subscribers on there. And then also go check out the pin tweet on our Twitter at around the 412. It is our GoFundMe fundraiser for this Christmas called Rocket Around the 412. It's year five, folks. We've been doing this for a while. Uh, you can also go to GoFundMe.com and search Rocket Around the 412, and it will pop up there as well, and you can read all about it. There you go. Um, other than that, I think that would do it. For Smitty, for Tyler, this has been Around the 412. We are sponsored by Keats Barbershop, located in Rochester, PA. You can also check him out on social media at Keats Barbershop. 
like his Facebook page, follow him on Instagram, all that good stuff. Uh, we have Instagram. I think we're going to try to get more active on there as well. Also, I have a question for you. If you guys are watching on YouTube, if you're listening elsewhere, you can just tweet at us. How do you guys feel about YouTube shorts? It's kind of something that I've thought about maybe getting into for clips of the show. I know they're pretty popular, but I'm not going to do something if it's not anything that our uh, listeners, viewers would be interested in. So I want some feedback on that as well. But other than that, for Smitty, for Tyler, this has been another episode of Around the 412, and we will talk to you guys next week. Bye-bye.